give us us free. Give us free. Your Honor, please instruct the defendant that he cannot disrupt these proceedings with such a Give us us free. If we are to have any semblance of order in this do this. Unity and welcome my conscious and unconscious family and friends. This is the all new Black Village Community Podcast, and I am truly your host of the show, JC, aka Afro Black, dropping nothing but the raw and uncut without any fear. As I use my mic as a spear to chuck a chuck you with liberated truth, I am your host and your native soldier in the struggle. My purpose and mission for this show is first to enlighten, inform, and engage. And I want to engage with all who claim to know the truth. All truth seekers and my native family, I welcome you. This show is dedicated to all our indigenous native ancestors and to all those who've carried the mantle of truth and to every person with the ability to throw off the chains of comfortable habit and unwarranted assumption and move in a new liberated direction that is guided by truth and observational evidence no matter where that direction may lead you my main objective and purpose here is freedom mind soul and spirit that being said Welcome to the Black Village Community Podcast and much love from our great universal goddess and mother of all living here and above. DC in the house. For you guys, this is black and brown pride Bring it on the system one time Now don't get me wrong, it's more than a song It's black and brown pride one time Do something for you guys, this is black and brown pride Bring it on the system one time Now don't get me wrong, it's more than a song It's black and brown pride one time this ain't school, but son, it be taught. And since I'm a leader, I'm a teacher, game and no cost is what I give. But you don't owe me nothing, I can't teach you how to live. But you better stop fronting if you bang in, cut it out. Only bang on the system. Green light, bring the black pride, my mission. Got a lot of soldiers in prison, our past leaders dead. Blame it on the government. I don't fuck with the feds, I'm doing research instead. Y'all from Garvey, Huey, pick up to dead bread. Get up, that's what I did. I fuck up while I'm trying to reprogram a little glitch. Hope I don't freeze up and go cold And it's too late, too late to pray Some of y'all gon' feel me, but most of y'all gon' hate Anyway, I got something to say Before I pass away, hope I make a new way Love to see a new day Do something for you die, this is black and brown pride Banging on the system one time Now don't get me wrong, it's more than a song It's black and brown pride one time Do something for you die, this is black and brown pride Banging on the system one time now don't get me wrong, it's more than a song It's black and brown pride one time Hey, 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 this is JCA Capital Black And I am here with you for another delicious black Sunday To drop nothing but the raw and uncut here on the black village community podcast and today's podcast subject matter oh wow i believe it's something that you don't hear a lot of people talking about you know it's kind of seemed like people sweep under the rug you know so to speak and it's uh, you know it's just as much as a hot topic uh as talking about 
uh, racism between black and white. But we're going to talk about something that's more important than, in my opinion, than the relationship between black and white. And the reason why is because uh, who I'm going to talk about is a literal relative of the indigenous black community. And that's black and brown pride. Excuse me. As black and brown pride, as you heard in that music intro on that rap that you just heard by uh, young brother K Neezy, uh, which you hear that that little rap intro in uh, in the show's intro. That's by K Neezy. Uh, black and brown pride. Exactly. We're gonna talk about today. Talk about that today. And today's podcast topic is the dividing breakdown with the black and brown unity. We're going to talk about that again, the dividing breakdown with black and brown unity. So we're going to talk about that subtitle, the invisible wall of bigotry. So we're going to talk about that today. Uh, what we need to do, what's going on. Is it, is there really uh, um, a divide between the black and brown community, black and brown families, black and brown friendship, and just black and brown in general? Is there really a divide? And where, where, what, what does it stem from? Why is there um, a divide between black and brown peoples when we have so much in common, so much uh, oppression uh, from the same uh, enemy, same uh, that stems from the same, um, you know, enemy, so to speak? You feel me? And so we're gonna talk about this. Let me change the tone, and I'm not by myself. My queen is joining me here here today on the on the uh, Sunday show today. And so let me bring her in, but let me change the tone so we have something more laid back to talk to as far as music is concerned, as I always play my favorite. There we go. A Tribe Called Red. Okay, so we're going to vibrate today on something that I think is close to home with a lot of people and a, a subject matter that should be spoken within the communities. Within the communities, it should be spoken between the elders, the grandparents, the parents, the aunties, the uncles. Uh, and I'm talking, when I say, and I'm not just talking about within the homes. I'm talking about literally in the communities. Black and brown people need to come together and talk about what's going on. The real meat, the real root of the situation. And so on that note, let me present my queen so she can join me on this subject matter. Go ahead and holler at the, at the Conscious Community Queen. Hello, my beautiful people. So you heard some of what I was saying about this topic matter, which we're going to talk about the divide and breakdown with the black and brown unity, something that has a long history. When you talk about black and brown unity, there is a long history uh, that goes so far back. It goes even far as into before America was called America, before America became a united nation. Uh, that goes so far back it goes further than uh, slavery or you know would you say queen yeah it does it truly does because um, before colonialism before the Spanish conquest you know the indigenous peoples of what is now called Mexico and now the United States you know they may have had differences but they still were pretty much the indigenous peoples pretty much all looked relatively the same exactly exactly you With know what? different cultures and not always exactly the same you know they share common features commonalities common um threads of life but they were not at odds in war with each other like they are today you, the hurtful thing about this is that you have a lot of uh, uh people black and brown not just just not just mexican people but also black folks that don't care about uh, the the rooted history that we have that's so rooted that we're literally we're a family mm -hmm. we're literally the black and brown the Mexican and black people we're literally relatives and you got those in the Latino community and those in the black community that don't even want to even listen hear realize accept history let alone somebody close to them like a family member like a grandmother or grandfather tell them the raw and, uh, raw and uncut truth they don't even want to hear that they don't want to see it there's so much hatred there so much pain so much so many wounds and scars mm -hmm. and the question is where did it come from where did this all this hatred come from um uh, you know you know where at one time um you know latino families not only got along not only 
uh, socialized, but they actually literally intermingled, you know, like family came together. You know, sometimes somebody's daughter dated somebody's son or somebody's son dated somebody's daughter and one was black and one was Latino. And in a lot of cases, you know, you still got a lot of black and brown people coming together. And I got information, you know, some articles I want to read mm-hmm. that speak to this. I also got some audio cast I want to play that speaks to the, the, the systemic um, hatred that's going on between Latino people. And uh, in the specific um, that has filtered down into the streets to the degree that you got uh, Latino gangs and black gangs literally gunning each other down and hurting and killing each other and innocent people getting caught in between the crossfire. So and they're so. basically still doing what the um, colonialists, the imperialists want us to do is to destroy ourselves. they doing exactly that, but in the process I truly believe, and I have enough intelligence, and I know you do too, Queen, as well as a lot of other conscious brothers and sisters out there knowing that there is a puppet master that's behind the scenes that's controlling the puppets mm-hmm. regardless of and, and 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 we know the puppets don't know they're being 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 controlled we know the puppets don't know that they're that that a puppeteer is pulling the strings um almost kind of reminds me of um plato's allegory the story of plato's allegory oh, yeah. you know when you got the uh group of people looking at the uh figures on the wall the shadows on the wall and can't move and can't look behind them don't even know that there's somebody making these shadows they gazing at the shadows as if the shadows are real shadows not realizing that there's somebody behind them and that they can actually leave the cave they believe they're stuck in the cave and can't get out and that's the same as these gangs people who are caught in gangs and don't believe they can get out because they've done too much or have too much done to them or they've gained such a reputation that they feel like they have to continue on in the game and can't get out of the game of gang violence and activity and as a result they're looking nothing but the streets that's all they see is what they've done and what's been done to them and that's why i'm saying it kind of reminds me of plato's allegory where the people in the cave are stuck and looking at the figures on the wall not realizing there's somebody behind the scene that's actually orchestrating the whole thing yeah and so we know that the police department government officials uh white supremacist organizations are definitely behind the scenes orchestrating and agitating and aggravating uh, the violence between black and brown it's gonna have to be black and brown people to have enough intelligence to not allow the infection to fester that 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 that, that, that neither one of them has caused you feel me and so um speaking to that let me you know uh, before we go into any articles let me play some audio cast that i really 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 want to play that's going to speak to what we're talking about because uh, a lot of the hatred a lot of the pain a lot of the white supremacy and what cracked me up is how in the hell does white supremacy mean a white supremacy has the ability to move within the latino community so because when i talk about white supremacy white supremacy is not in the black community what I will admit to what is in the black community is the aftermath of hatred, the aftermath of prejudice and bigotry, not white supremacy, because white supremacy has power. White supremacy has political power, political influence, political connections. White supremacy has the ability to network itself from one area to the next, from the up to the top, from the lowest to the least into the top as well mm-hmm. white supremacy has those abilities it, it's like it's like a cancer it, it, it moves it morphs and so um and i'm saying this due to the fact that the latino community has those connections and it, it appears to me and due to some information that i want to read i've read that i've discovered it appears to me that uh, those within the mexican and latino community who are elite are those who are wealthy as well as those who are upper class um, are the ones that are that are um, manipulating as well as contributing to the white supremacy within the Latino community. In other words, they're not trying to stop it. They're not trying to change it. And this this uh, prejudice and this bigotry and this white supremacy within the Latino community has gotten so uh, strong that it even has branched into education and academia is willing to hide information and erase information just because of indigenous history proving that the people are of black art dark complexion and so this is what i'm talking about this this type of white white supremacy 
has to be addressed, has to be exposed. You feel me? So that people can recognize and people can see. But also in the process of this, let me also say that you can always join us here at the Black Village. It doesn't cost you a dime. Just be your conscious time. You can chime in at 855-445-9340. You can also chime in at 857-232-0155. And don't forget the conference key to get to the conference. Notice it here in the conference room of truth here with me and my queen to discuss any topic that we are discussing Nine four seven five nine five is the conference code. Now nine four seven five nine five. So yeah, um, on that. You no, know, I got you know. I'm gonna play this audio cast, which I think is very important because um, white supremacy don't just. I mean, if you notice, it's just like in the white community. You know, white supremacy got um, so bad uh, from the beginning because it starts at the top with those in the elite uh, that it fetch that it, it trickles down. And, um, down through through the educational through the system itself into the community and from the community into the streets and it's where you have gangs just like you have skinheads you you know you feel me all right queen uh, yeah and so it's done that into the latino community now the gangs were already there but now these gangs have embraced white supremacy and hatred and um you know the the the, the um the, the the killings and the hurt and pain is only an ex- uh, an excuse and an extension to perpetrate um, uh, hatred and and, uh, and bigotry, and that needs to change. That needs to change on both ends, brown and black. You feel me? And so, on that note, let me play this audio cast, and we will continue our discussion from there. This moment, something that USC researcher Alex Alonzo, who has already mapped out all black gang territory in L.A. County, says Compton leads the list. But Compton, for a city, you know, of its size, having 36 black gangs, um, represented the highest percent gang turf of any city on the list. His research shows black gangs claim 54% of the territory in Compton. I wonder what CHS stands for. And unlike many desk-bound academics, Alonzo's studies take him out to the streets. Whenever you see abandoned homes, man, that's a sign of drama and issues going on in the community. But more than abandoned homes, Alonzo's research depends on another kind of sign. It's called graffiti, scribbled on walls, curbs, and fence poles. Graffiti marks territory. This is a very territorial example of graffiti because of the arrow. When you see the arrow pointing down, you know that you're in that turf of that gang. For each sign of graffiti, he notes the intersection or the street where he sees it. And continue doing that until I get enough information to determine it's gang turf. And not only does graffiti tell him where a certain gang is located, but what's going on there. This gang right here, CVTKS. They don't get along with CV70. I've seen them crossing each other out. He is constantly snapping photos and rolling off video, documenting what he knows and never hesitating to ask the locals about what he doesn't know. I got a question for you fellas. What does the CHS and CV70 mean? Having already mapped all the black gangs in L.A. County, Alonzo, who is working on his Ph.D., has now set out to map all the Latino gangs in L.A. County. And what he is finding here in Compton is disturbing. And it says the gang war is also a race war. Here, FTP stands for Fruit Town Pyrus, a black blood gang. It's crossed out, meaning death. CKBK stands for Crip Killers and Blood Killers. TF represents Tortilla Flats a Mexican gang sending this message to blacks. Wait till I show my homeboy this stuff. He doesn't believe that it's going on. But you know, Luis Lozano why, why believes why what's going him? on. He, he says his father was executed man. three months ago yeah, by Fruit Town Piru Bloods. And shot him cold blood, you know, they still, like, they blew his head off, man. You know, that's not right, man. 51-year-old Lomito Lozano was just an honest, hard-working Mexican immigrant with five children. His wife says Lomito cherished his family. He'd come to pick up this stalled camper just a few blocks from the family home when the Pyrus just shot him down. 
you never know. When you see a black this, you young guy, Mexican, you don't know if he's pissed he's at black. you or... You don't know nothing, you know? As I say, you know, innocent people always die. And the day after Lomito Lozano was murdered, there was retaliation. Another innocent victim ended up dead. This time, a car was shot up in a fruit town blood neighborhood. A Mexican died, so a black had to die. The reality is that this particular vehicle was targeted. It was shot numerous times by assault weapons. 21-year-old Lakeisha Darden, who was in town for a few days visiting friends, made the mistake of accepting a ride from some youths associated with Fruit Town Pyrus. Battered with bullets, she died in the back seat. Police have arrested these two Tortilla Flats gangsters for the murder. A third suspect, Eric Castillo, known as Tweety, is still on the run. People like Luis Lozano have had enough uh, okay, of the no, gang yeah, racial this, tension. You know, it don't matter if they're black, Mexican, whatever, you know. You know, I just need, you know, I just want all this to stop, you know. All this innocent, innocent killing. Meanwhile, researcher Alex Alonzo keeps running into signs that it's not going to stop. And it bothers him too. Because it's about race, it's racial differences. It's not even about gang banging. So when he sees it. Oh, this is a great shot right here. He continues to document what he calls the biggest little secret going on in the streets now. Racial fighting that's going on between the Mexican gangs and the black gangs in Compton. And not just in Compton. Yeah, I think it's wrong. Compton police sources tell us there have been more than a dozen similar killings so far this year. Alonzo hopes his research can bring attention to the problem. The people will then acknowledge that this racial conflict actually exists and then do something about it before it gets even worse. In Compton, Chris Blatchford, Fox 11 News. There you go. That's it right there. You heard it. Uh, you know, it's, it's a sad, sad, sad situation. Hurtful hurtful situation you got um black, black and brown people gunning each other down you know and it, it, it wow no you bro know? what i mean well, it doesn't it, even make any type of sense because they're killing each other over the fact that they're two different races well you know not, not only that i mean it's a cycle that 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 won't that won't end unless both uh people sit down the elders the mothers the grandparents the aunties the cousins, the uncles, sit down and, um, you know, talk about the situation and realize that, you know, each uh, group that has idiots in the group, what is those idiots? Idiots are people who just do things just because, you know, do things out of ignorance, both black and brown. You got ignorant black people, you got ignorant brown people and, um, you know, and, you know, that do stupid things. And we can't allow their stupidity to spill out to the degree that we, that others in the, fa other people in the family, other people in the community, both black and brown, who are not idiots, allow the idiot disease to affect us. And then we start to do things and break down our relationship and our communication with one another. We can't allow that to happen. And so that, that has to change. And, and a lot of time, those who in the, in the group, both black and brown, those idiots in the group who fester and feed on ignorance are the ones that are allowing themselves to be influenced by white supremacy and ignorance. You feel me? And so that's why, you know, this stuff has to be exposed, has to be talked about. You know, uh, black and brown have to sit down. You know, we yeah, all. I agree with you. I mean, he's, it's got to stop. Yeah, yeah. You know, really it does. I mean, we. It's not even, it's not even gang related violence anymore it's just two different cultures warring each other because they're different i mean that's just the whole um colonialism european agenda of taking over the land period is getting their problem to solve itself by destroying each other and only people who capitalize and benefit from black and brown people killing each other are not black and brown people is white supremacy and those who are sitting on top looking down mm -hmm. and 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 you know and laughing at the whole situation because it's accompli accomplishing what they want without them having to really be involved That's true. you know and so but i want to um um i got this article here i want to read um which is from the pew research center social demographic trends 
And this article I want to read is titled, uh, this article I want to read is titled, Do Blacks and Hispanics Get Along? Uh, so, you see it there, Queen? Yep. And my sis has just joined us here in the conference room of truth. What's happening, sis? I really enjoy when you join us. Yes, I had to hurry up and cut my, um, I was going, I was on live on Facebook and I kind of ran into the, to, to your time, so I, I hurry up and cut it short. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here. I always enjoy when you're here and hear your, uh, your insight and your perspective on things. And today's podcast subject, so you know what we're talking about, is titled The Divide and Breakdown with Black and Brown Unity. And so I just got to, I just uh, got done finishing playing an audio cast that spoke to some of what we were talking about. Uh, this audio cast was talking about how Mexican gangs and black gangs, they're not fighting each other over turf. They're not fighting each other over drugs. They're not fighting each other over money. They fight each other because they don't like each other because one black and one is brown. Because one is Mexican and one is black. And they're killing each other. It's basically, it's, big, it's the hate of, and ignorance of bigotry and prejudice that's uh, causing uh, death and mayhem in Los Angeles. And so, and, and it's not just in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is just one of the demographics that's being spoken about right now because, you know, we're in California. So I played an audio cast on that. So right now, I want to read this article that speaks to this. this is, you know, basically, this is a research uh, um, company, a research uh, organization that basically does studies. And they did a study. And the study is called Do Blacks and Hispanics Get Along? Yes, but not always, and not about everything. So, Queen, could you please read that? While blacks and Hispanics hold bro broadly favorable views of each other, Hispanics are less likely to say the two groups get along well. At the same time, African Americans are far more likely than Latinos to say blacks are frequently the victim of racial discrimination, according to a recent survey of racial and ethnic attitudes by the Pew Research Center. The country's two largest and most powerful minority groups also disagree on other issues that strike close to the heart of many blacks and Hispanics, though these differences are generally modest. Notably, blacks are more likely to say the situation for African Americans is worse today than it was five or even ten years ago. Nearly half of all blacks also say immigrants reduce job opportunities for blacks, while fewer than four in ten Hispanics agree. The current round of dem Democratic presidential primaries has brought a, a, the issue of Hispanic-Black relations and onto center stage. Overwhelming majorities of blacks have supported Barack Obama, while Hillary Clinton has counted on majority support among Hispanics, coupled with her strong support from whites to counter Obama's appeal among African American voters. Let's just, let's drop down to uh, the part where it says Hispanics are more likely to say to say groups do not get along. Let's drop that. I don't want to really care about the right now because I'm not focusing on the politics and the political issue between blacks and whites and the differences on politics. Let's drop down to this next paragraph where it says Hispanics are more likely to say groups do not get along. The survey found that overwhelming majorities of both blacks and Hispanics have favorable views of each other. Fully three-quarters of all blacks, which is 77%, have a very or somewhat favorable view of Latinos, while 79% of Hispanics have a similar positive view of blacks. Three-quarters of all whites also have the approving view of Hispanics and slightly larger percent expressed a favorable opinion of blacks. But some differences begin to emerge when blacks and Hispanics are asked how well the two groups get along. The majority of blacks, 70%, but a smaller share of Hispanics, 7%, say the groups get along very or fairly well. At the same time, Hispanics are significantly more likely than blacks to say that inner group relations are strained, 30% versus 18%. Whites are roughly equally divided, with nearly 4 in 10, which is 39%, saying that blacks and Hispanics get along well, 32% saying they do not, while nearly as many express no opinion. The perception gap on intergroup relations persists even when controlling for socioeconomic status. For example, 63% of all better educated Hispanics those who had attended college say blacks and Latinos get along well compared to 73% of similarly educated blacks. That's a 10 point difference. Little difference than the overall 13 point gap between the two groups, 
Similar differences emerged in most age and income categories as well. And that's a trip. Basically, showing it is a, a seriously confusing uh, statistic, a statistical difference between groups on how they think about each other uh, versus educated, not not educated. And even when it comes to the way they think about each other as far as, um, um, like right here where it says, uh, the, very, they, uh, they, the survey found that overwhelming majority of both blacks and Hispanics have favorable views of each other. Fully, uh, fully three quarters of all blacks have a very, they, they both practically have the same perspective when it comes to just talking in, 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 the, uh, in, in the general, pers- um, in the general stratus as far as, you know, do you guys think y'all like each other? You guys think you guys get along over here to the, over here to the, uh, to the right. I'm pretty sure you see that queen where it's showing, it's showing the statistical gra you know, this great, this, um, graph over here mm-hmm. you know and i'm like tripping off there how close there's differences but at the same time there's no differences you know there's different you know there's no differences practically when it comes to talking to them in a general perspective of what they think about each other but when you break it down to economics about what they think in education then there's like you see she said there's a 10 percent difference you know um the thing i trip off of is this when it comes to education when it comes to economics when it comes to things of that nature um latinos and blacks both know how it feels to be discriminated against they know how it feels to struggle they know how it feels to wonder where your next pay, you know paycheck or your next b- piece of bread is going to come from and you know giving it to your children before eating it yourself because you got to think of your kids first um they know how that feels they know how it feels to be um brutalized by police um, to um, to have your children uh, taken advantage of by the school system. They know how it feels. But yet at the same time, there's a wide wedge. There's a huge gap in perspective of us reaching out to each other, in perspective of us sharing the same political views, in perspective of us living next door to each other and acting like, acting like neighbors, but actually really being neighbors to one another. You feel me? So I'm just wondering why? Why does this thing persist? I mean, what's going on? Why is it such so persistent of um, you know, you know, us not being able to create and commit to black and brown unity? You know, they got the slogan that says black and brown pride, but you see, before you can have pride, you got to have a sense of unity. You know, you can have uh, a unified effort or a unified front of pride without true unity being the glue to bring the pride together. So um, let's read this. Yeah, part. It, to Go me, ahead. it looks like this demographic is really not taking in consideration the uh, the violence of the um, racial wars that are going on in, in cities. Well, no, it, it doesn't. It's just talking. Basically it's just basic, just base, just numbers, just statistics. Uh, what about love thy neighbor? That read that right there. All right, it says, does familiarity, familiarity breed tolerance or contempt? It depends. Hispanics and blacks living in counties with relatively high concentrations of African Americans are somewhat more likely to say that blacks and Latinos get along well. 65% Hispanic, 72% blacks. Then are Hispanics and blacks living in a low density black counties? 57% and 50% respectively. Suggesting a proximity is associated with greater acceptance. But there is no difference in perceptions of relations between blacks and Hispanics between who live in counties with relatively higher or lower concentrations of Latinos. In either case, about two-thirds of blacks and six and ten Hispanics think the two groups get along well. And, and that's true. I mean, um, um, you know, there is not a black neighborhood where you don't have a Latino family living in that neighborhood. I mean, I, I, uh, I have a hard time accepting that. You don't have at least one or two or more living near or in or close to a black neighborhood. We live in each other's neighborhoods, bottom line. You got blacks living in Latino neighborhoods, and you got Latinos living in black neighborhoods. Now, they are concentrated areas, uh, like in East L.A. and other areas uh, where Latinos live, where there is no black people. You know, and, and it appears they don't want black people living in their neighborhoods as well. You know, 
Um, um, I can we can read on with the statistic, but I want to move on to the next um, next thing because it goes on and it talks about immigration and it talks about um, the differences and core uh, issues like politics and racial issues. Um, um, you know how it talks about some key uh, somehow how some key groups, both in key groups as far as uh, black and Latino, uh, black and brown groups. For example, issues of racial discrimination, black sick now, how they have, you know, they see things differently, how some Latinos, they do, they see discrimination. They see how blacks get discriminated. Blacks see how Latinos get discriminated, but they both see it differently in the aspect of how often it happens. You know, that's like looking at when I just like from my perspective, you know, when I look at Latinos, it seems like black Latinos have more opportunities than black people do. But see, I'm not a Latino, so it might just look like that to me from my perspective doesn't mean that it necessarily is but then we can look at the actual facts when you look at how business how many you know you have areas where you have latino businesses but you don't have an area that's popular where it's just black businesses there's not there's not there's not one area where there's only black businesses you're going if you find an area where there's some black businesses you're going to find some white businesses there you're going to find some latino businesses but you can go into areas where there's latino businesses and there's no black business next to or near that black that area or you know where those latino businesses are at you know you know what i'm talking about right Queen? yeah so there is some in indif- there's some economic imbalance there and i and you know and this and like i said talking about where does this core what does the root of all this prejudice economic instability inequality is coming from white supremacy White supremacy is the source, and so and it, and you know and if it, if it you know and if we can see that it's affecting us as a people, poor blacks, poor Latinos, educated blacks, educated Latinos, that white supremacy is still affecting us in the essence as we try to take care of our families, as we try to educate ourselves, as we vote. Not against our interests, but but in the best interest of our interests for our families, and we see still see um, white supremacy, prejudice, and bigotry from the system. Then why are we perpetr- uh, perpetrating it on one another? Why? 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 Well, I'm I'm gonna tell you why. You know, from my conscious perspective, a lot of Latinos will not check and balance themselves will not balance and check their families will not balance and check their friends you know from the perspective of dealing with white supremacy and prejudice and bigotry in their families and so on that note uh, I have another article I want to read right quick before I go into any more audio cast I have also another audio cast I want to play but I want this article I want to read right here which is cu- titled uh, black and brown love is revolutionary. Um, it's by it's by um, it says via quick cur- <laughs> Cor- huh? quirky, quirky, quirky brown, brown love. <laughs> Go ahead and read that queen, please. This is a blog post from the Young Woman's website. There is something about black and brown love that moves me. Perhaps it is because I always. I was always told to watch out for those people growing up. In the ninth grade, when you are the only Morinta girl in a Mexicana group, you see the truth in your loved one's warnings firsthand. Backhanded racist comments from can comments from can run wild in that situation. Harsh comments about your hair, skin, culture, surface. And the sentiments run both ways. I've heard some pretty prejudiced stuff come out of the mouths of black people and brown people too. Let me clarify what I mean by black. I am fully aware that there are black Latinas, but for the purpose of this narrative, black is African American. Brown refers to non-black Latinas. Now that we have that out of the way, back to the narrative. In my high school's lunchroom, the division between was evident. Sure, black folks and brown folks interacted a bit in the classroom, but the lunchroom was a version of Mean Girls that Tina Fey did not write. The brown kids met up with the south side, up on the south side of the room, and the black people were on the north side. I and a few others disrupted all of that by hanging out with whatever group we wanted to. 
Our pioneering ways were met with resistance from our respective communities and sometimes the communities we were trying to be a part of. Wow. Um, you guys can read more of Katina Reed from here. Oops. Oh, that link is broken. But this girl was in high school. This is a high, this is a girl from high school who's writing about the the, the division that she sees in her, high, her in her high school between black and brown people. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. And and in most cases, when kids are exemplifying any type of negative character, in most not all the time, but in but I will say more than half the time. That's something that's a, it's a learned habit from home, like racism and prejudice and bigotry. It's a learned habit from home, meaning the parents exhibit those type of negative characteristic tra- char- characteristical traits. Are both parents, one parent, uncle, grandmother, somebody is an influence in the children in a, in a way to the degree that they think is okay. They believe it's okay to treat others in that way because it's okay at home and this is the reason why racism prejudice and bigotry has to be stopped and checked balanced at home parents have to care it doesn't make sense to me we live in this country we live in a multicultural country with so many different races of people you know from Mexican to black to Indian to I'll say Indian to India Indian to you know to all the different shades and colors of different races of people from across the spectrum that comes to America to live here for a better way of life and then you got the ignorance of white supremacy the ignorance of white supremacy that doesn't benefit anybody of color whatsoever to act it out because just as well as you act it out towards your fellow brother your fellow sister the next white devil is going to not only act it out but perpetually oppress you with it and you and then you turn around and you just you just share it with the next brother or sister doesn't make sense to me so i'm opening up my conference room my sis my brother you guys got anything you want to say about the divide and breakdown between black and brown you know can anybody comment on that give your perspective of it before i play this audio cast i want to play which is a very hurtful audio cast is talking about how the white supremacy of ignorance is affecting um, the black and brown community to the degree that they're killing you know the gangs are killing each other not because of turf not because of money and drugs but because of color because of their colors they're killing each other because of the color of the skin not the color of the rag that they're, they're flying but because of the color of their skin they're killing each other so anybody in the conference room have any comments they might want to shine on this um, well, I just want to say that it's not a um, that the, it's a sickness it's an illness that's going on that's in the minds of the people and it's not color it has no color it's the dysfunctional mentalness of um that people is walking around and they feeling like there's nothing wrong with them or they're fine and they having all these issues you know it's a human race that i see that you know it's the human race and, and, and it's a sickness that came upon humanity due to the uh the white man you know due to um the lack of to to even survive. So it's um it's a um, it's stress, it's depression, it's you know, the it's fear and it's it's, it's targeting more of the, the black and brown, you know, like you said that, you know, we're not Mexican, so to the Mexicans they can feel that you know is is more of them, them being you know crim, uh, uh, criminalized or I would say uh, it's more of them that's suffering or you know what I'm saying it's easy for us to say that it's more of us that's being um, uh, that's dysfunction or being targeted you know because we speaking from a personal point of view but it could be 
uh, uh, the Mexicans. They can they feel the same way that we feel, you know. So it's it's not a matter of the uh, uh, color. It's humanity, you know. It's even white people out here that suffering. Like my neighbor, we had a talk this morning, and she, she's white, and she's suffering from depression, and she's suffering feeling like nobody loves her and she was telling me how her dog give her she feel like her dog give her the love you know that she's not getting now when it gets that bad to where we have to turn to 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 animals you're not saying that animals are not good you know because they serve their purpose and we do need animals and animals need us but when humanity as a whole as a collective is, is like we can't find no love or uh, purpose anywhere to where now we have to turn to animals. That means that we are getting to to the end of the rope. And things have to get worse before it gets better. You know, exactly. because people don't do not want to change. The, the, and then for one and then people will shift the blame. So the thing is is that we have to turn back to nature, you know, so you know, that's why I have my little sassy, my dog, because, you know, dogs do have emotions and feelings, and they, and they love you unconditional. where I can't say that for human beings, and that's sad, you know? And it's, and it's, and it's hurtful to see that our people, you know, is, first of all, don't know who they are. You know, we're Native Americans, and we think we're African Americans, for one. So if you don't know who you are, then you don't know where to go. You don't know where to start to to heal yourself. Well, see, then that was anything, also also also. Let me say this. Also, you know, the, like the, the ignorance of, of bigotry, the ignorance of big, bigotry, and I say not now. There's bigotry and prejudice in this white supremacy. Now, bigotry and prejudice means the same thing. Okay, uh, it's just that with prejudice, you can be subtly prejudiced. They can be different levels of prejudice. You can be subtly prejudiced, meaning that I don't mind a black person living next door to me. I don't want them dating my don't want them dating my daughter. I want my kids dating their kids. But they can work. I can work with them, and we can eat together. That's one level of prejudice. Then you got an extreme version of of being a bigot, where you don't even want to eat with them, don't want to be around them, don't want to live with them, don't work with, don't want to work with them. Then you got white supremacy. White supremacy has connections with the federal government. White supremacy has money. White supremacy has power, influence. White supremacy can use somebody else like a puppet to do its work so it don't get his hands bloody, wet, or dirty. That's the power of white supremacy. And so I was saying earlier that I see white supremacy operating in the Latino and Mexican community. Okay, what operates in the black community is not white supremacy it's 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 a prejudice okay it's not even bigotry it's not even bigotry i, I don't care you can have the most ignorant black person that say whatever they want to say negative about a mexican or a latino they still don't operate in bigotry why because in most black families there's somebody else that's some from somewhere else regardless if it's a white person in the black family that married into the family or then dated and got somebody black in the family pregnant or if it's a latino or asian black people we embrace a little bit of, we embrace everybody we we are we are inclusionists. We include everybody. We open arms to everybody to one degree or another or to one level or another. But in the Latino community, you have groups of Latinos, large groups, large groups, influential from the father to the mother, to the grandmother, to the grandfather, that are straight prejudiced, bigoted, as well as there are there are there are levels of Latinos by wealth who have political power as well as um, economic power meaning they got money big money loud pockets who are bigots who are prejudiced and they operate in white supremacy and even in the prison system okay even at the levels of those in organized crime like the mexican mafia okay they operate and they use their prejudice and their power to extend itself and it's very well seen and is very well operating in the latino community so, it's, you know, you got those out there who want to try to put things on an equal balance with the black with the black and brown. I'm more of a realist. And I'll admit within the black community, you have black people who say negative things and bad things about Latinos. 
you got black people and very obvious because you got gang violence going on so you got black people shooting and killing latinos and you got latinos shooting and killing blacks and all that does is fester prejudice and bigotry between the two of us and the two groups but though but but on the level of those who are looking at the whole situation who are not deeply affected by it meaning that i'm not because i'm not a gang member and my kids are not gang members but you know i do know others who are but so i'm like on the outside looking in so those of us on the level who are who are who are affected but not deeply affected by it we can see the white supremacy that is actually operating behind the scenes when it comes to the gang violence when it comes to the families when it comes to the community and when it comes to the politics okay prime example civil rights movement where was the latinos at where was the mexicans at due to civil rights movement of black folks huh when it comes to politics like barack obama barack obama got 90 percent of the vote from the black community he got about i think 60 percent or uh, about 60 a little bit more than 60 percent from the latino community he didn't get all the latino co- community vote why because you had th- those latinos who are conservative you have those a large a, a community that are prejudiced and bigoted and white supremacist and then you have those who are loyal to just loyal to white folks who ain't gonna vote for a black man and got nothing to do with uh prejudice and got nothing to do with bigotry it's just not for their best interest to be voting for a black man because they got too many white friends so my point being is that there's a lot of things that's in this pot that's causing confusion between black and brown and What's really going to settle the whole incursion of what's going on is going to take the Latino women, mothers, grandmothers, aunties. It's going to take the Latino men, uncles, fathers, and grandfathers sitting down without the influence of the white devil. Without the influence of the white devil or the federal government. It's going to take the community sitting down, talking about things talking about what they need to do to bring resolution and to be a family again not just be friends not just be neighbors but to be family because me and my wife discovered doing some research that black and brown people not only have a long history together but we also got uh, a relative in common and that's the indigenous indian native american we the, the mexican as well as black people we got that ancestor in common and you have a lot of latinos uh, educated Latinos that are denying that history. Isn't that true, Queen? Absolutely. You know, whitewashing history. Um, I got some information right here, matter of fact, but, but before I go into other historical information, because I want to I think I'm gonna do that on a part two of next week. I'm gonna bring in his historical information proven um that black people and Latino people have indigenous Indian people as a common ancestor, making us relatives. I'm gonna do that next week. So right now I'm gonna I just want to talk about what is the root problem between the black and brown. Well, we got so many things in common. We have so many commonalities. So many. And when I say commonalities, I'm not just talking about the fact that we have uh, poverty and being poor and being at the bottom of the economic totem pole in common. But we also have in common that we all want the best for our family. We want our children to be educated. We all we got a lot of things in common. As well as the fact that we have a political system, which is the government that works against us. That in common as well. We have so many things in common, as well as the most important thing that we have in common is that we have a common ancestor in that, that we have in common. And that ancestor is the indigenous people of Turtle Island, the indigenous people of North America. And that makes us family. And that needs to be brought out. That really needs to be brought out. Ignorant house Negroes need to stop being ignorant house Negroes educated black folks who are scholars who are archaeologists they need to just break out and tell the wrong uncut truth stop lying stop you know stop uh being the the puppy to the white man you know afraid to say the wrong thing because the wrong thing might be the right thing but it might be the wrong thing for their career or the wrong thing to make the white man mad so they say the the right thing that's the in the right thing in the right interest of the white man but even though it's not the right thing to say do y'all get my drift yeah i hope y'all got i hope y'all caught that <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you go you get what i'm saying basically just 
say, you know, because see, what's written in our history books and what anthropologists, geologists, archaeologists, and all these educated people who put together our history for us and put them in the form of books for our kids to read in school, put on college campuses and libraries and in bookstores for us to buy to educate ourselves, we got to realize and we got to be honest with ourselves. A lot of times these people are being influenced and, and controlled. Regardless of this being influenced and controlled by the powers to be, which is governments, or the elite, meaning wealthy people with political power, or if it's just their own ignorance because of the way they were raised, which is their own personal prejudices and bigotries. You feel me? So we, whenever, yeah. so whenever you're reading history and researching history, you have to take those things into your mind while you're filtering the information. The person who's writing this book, what do they have to gain or lose for writing truth? If it's truth, you feel me? On top of the fact that we have to cross-reference our information. And what does this have to do with what we're talking about? Is the fact that we're talking about history, about black people being indigenous black Americans. And you got a group of Mexicans, a group of Latinos out there. When I say Latinos, it's not just Mexicans. It's, Puerto, it's racist, prejudiced, elitist, whitewashed, white-skinned, Puerto Ricans, um... Hondurans, all the, all these different breeds of of the Spaniards, uh, that's the, 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 of the children of the Spaniard people. You gotta be raw and uncut. All these different uh, ethnic Latino groups was created by the Spanish people who were exploring and conquering during the 13th and 14th century. That's just raw and uncut history that anybody can go read and find out for themselves. So in the process of that, these people are being controlled, and it affects history, and it, and history affects relationships. You get what I'm saying? That's what I'm trying to say in short. You feel me, everybody? History affects relationships. Yeah. And, and we, so, so what people don't know and what people do know affects relationships, regardless if it's affecting those relationships in a positive or a negative way. And you have a lot of Mexicans out there that tell, well, tell a black person in a minute. I've heard them. Well, tell them in a minute. You're not Indian. You're an African. You're a Negro. You're a nigger or a Negro or a Negros. How would that make them, knowing that their ancestors are just as black? Queen, you know, you know as well as I know, a lot of our brown Latino brothers and sisters lie to themselves and their families about Native American history. I know that. I'll never forget. I told you a story. I've told you, and I'm not sure if I told my sister, um, or a friend of mine, a, a Mexican. Hello, Hello? Uh -huh. you, you hear me? I, I don't. I said I don't want to say no names. <laughs> it was a friend of mine. Uh -huh. I had a com a friend that you might remember a friend of mine I had in common, and he was a Mexican friend, and um, he um, uh, I told him, you know, he's because he was reading a book on the Aztec Indians. He was reading a book on the Aztec Indians, and I asked him what language the Aztec Indians speak, and he said Spanish. I said no, Aztec Indians had their own indigenous native language. I said you do know the blood that runs through your veins also annihilated and destroyed the heritage of the people that runs through your veins <laughs> he said what i said your spanish language comes from spain spaniard people from spain were conquerors and they killed murdered massacred native americans which is also that blood that runs through your veins and so stuff like that Inf just basic information of truth a lot of the information is not disseminated like it should be it's not really given and taught like it should be to the Mexican and Latino community and a lot of times that's done that's that's and for the most part that's done purposely intentionally to, to, to keep the people in a state of ignorance of certain things and so then they, they give them an image of what these people look like that like they told like like I grew up we all grew up believing that Indians only look like they're light skinned with straight jet black hair and broad nose that's what we're taught that that's how the original Native American look. And come to find out when you do research, you find out that's not true. You found Native Americans look like black people. Look like look also look like yeah. the light skin. Oh, they all some of them look like the light skinned one as well. Some of them look like just brown skinned people. Some of them had some of them had kinky hair, some of them had curly hair. But they lied to us because they and how do they do that? By keeping the informa uh, information out of the schools, out of the libraries. And away from the fact that people, and not on television, so people don't get a chance to hear it, see it, and for themselves. You feel me? And so yeah, they keep you. They keep them uh, in the unknown. So what they don't know, they can't 
reflect. So exactly. Or stay a, out of ignorance. Not, not only can they not reflect, they can't make the connections as well. You can't make the connections if you don't if you don't educate yourself. If you don't open your mind up to information and education of the unknown or maybe what you don't know or what haven't been handed down to you. So it's important for us not only to educate ourselves, but to share the education with others. That's why information is power. You feel me? And and in my opinion, the Mexican community and the Latino community at large, ha- portions of the community has hid hid history, hid information on purpose because they they, they want to embrace the white image of appeasing and uh, appeasing white people to affiliate themselves with the lighter and brighter group of people because they have more money more influence more power and then you have a group of those who are just totally ignorant because they don't know because the information is not easily accessible for them and the school system is not teaching it you feel me so it's important for us you know we got black you know we got to share this information with our latino brothers and sisters you know that there are indigenous that we share an indigenous ancestor and that we got to stop hurting one another Uh, killing each other no we have to share the same um oppressor and yeah, exactly. We gotta let them know that we share the same oppressor. And that same I mean, oppressor is, is the is, is who our ancestors called the pale face, huh? The pale face, the white man. Still doing the dealing with the same conqueror, and where they where Mexico itself won its independence, it was through the help of with the native black folks of North America helping them. Exactly, exactly. That was another thing I didn't get a chance to read, but I'm gonna read my next podcast, my uh, next Sunday about um, the panda. I believe it was uh, the panda rosa. Um, uh, the the Mexican Revolution, the Mexican Revolution. Uh, black people helped them win that win that war. Black folks helped them win that war, and in the process, they also gave a safe haven to white people in Mexico. They gave it was they gave a safe haven for black people who are married to Mexicans, who are who are black people who are married to Native Americans, and so they can live in peace in Mexico because of the segregation and white supremacy that was going on in, in America in the early twenties. And in the early 19th century, they don't talk about that history. They don't talk about that. They don't talk about that how it was black people and who and exactly who black people is because they keep writing in history when they start talking about black people in history. They keep writing them as African Americans. When There's it should so just be few it, of those that were actually here. Though. Exactly, exactly. When they were not actually black African Americans, they're black Americans or indigenous black Americans. The word indigenous means the original people that that, that they are descended. Are they connected to our family member of the indigenous original people? Original people, the original people of America, which is the original Native American, the indigenous people of North America. So that information is really important. Power, information is power, power to the people. You feel me? That's why we got to say power to the people. People got to realize that power to the people means you got to embrace information. You can't be powerful if you don't know. You can't process something you don't know. You can't share something you don't know. You can't connect to something that you don't know. So you got to know. <laughs> so on that note, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, actually a little overdue over my time. But I really want to play. I got, I'm going to play this last clip before we go. I must play this last clip, which is in reference to what we're talking about. You know, because I, I know these clips that I'm playing is talking about what's going on. Between the conflict between the the, uh, the gangs in Los Angeles, the Mexican gangs and the black gangs, but it's important that you got to remember that the prejudice that that these that these uh, two groups are doing, the, the killings due to the prejudice and bigotry, not based on drugs and nothing like that, but just because of skin color and and ethnicity, they're killing each other. Something that they did not do before. Um, you got to realize that this stems. From something, it's stemming from something. But where is it stemming from? We start white white supremacy. But what area is it coming from? In the essence of where is it stemming from? You know, government, uh, police department. Where's the white supremacy coming from? We, family is one of them. Like I say, Mexicans gotta let go the prejudice and bigotry within their own families, their own groups, and their own affiliations. But you know what? There's more than just the me- the family, the Mexican family that's embracing white supremacy that's perpetuating the segregation and the disunity of the black and brown. So let me play this audio cast and we will be back to continue this subject matter and end my show because I'm I am at the end. So I, but I wanna play this. Play 
a frightening new development in the L.A.'s gang crisis, and it threatens everyone who lives here. Some call it ethnic terrorism. You might find some of the words and ideas expressed in this story to be inflammatory and vulgar. I know I did. We feel like, you know, hitting a Mexican across the head just because, then that's what we do. He's a gangbanger who goes by the name Killer, and with a name like that, he gets my full attention. But we're not giving no passes to no Mexicans that gangbang. But first, the frightening background on a new breed of gang. Experts are noticing something new here in South L.A. They call them emotional gangs. These are gangs that are not driven by greed or by drug dealing, but by hate and the need to define themselves by their enemies. Officers and, and, and people in position to do things to make a difference in communities, they've known about, they've known about the, the racial problem that, that's been going on here. They've known about it, and, you know, for, for... Charlene Lovett's daughter, Cheryl, was killed when members of the Latino 204th Street Gang were looking for an African-American, any African-American, to shoot. Take a look at this precious home video that even her mom is seeing right now for the first time. That's Cheryl dancing with her grandma three years ago. Oh, work it, Miss Charlene. You go, girl. A tight, upbeat family, seemingly without a care in the world, until a few days before Christmas. The light of her life was extinguished, and the pain that will never heal is the thought that nobody cared. They don't care. They don't care because they don't live in this community. They don't have to go. They don't have to worry about their kids. They don't have to worry about when they come in and out of their homes if their lives or their kids' lives are going to be taken. So they don't... They can't even fathom the thought to even think that way because they don't have to. But what about the people that can't afford to, to live that kind of lifestyle? <laughs> There is plenty of hatred to go around. Black gangs that hate Latinos. Latino gangs that hate African Americans. In the last four years, an 11% spike in gang violence that crosses racial lines. You have a lot of the uh, Latinos that are afraid uh, as, as well. They're afraid to, uh, to speak out. So it doesn't surprise you that it would be driven by emotion? No, not at all. Um, I think that's basic uh, psychology, human instinct. Absolutely. Riding with the gang detail in Southeast Division very early one Saturday morning, we get the sense the cops are passionate about their work, but overwhelmed by the enormity of the crisis. It's absolutely, uh, it can be very frustrating. Uh, the sheer violence that occurs here is incredible. Where is all this hate coming from? Gang expert Alex Alonso says it's really rather simple. Some of it is just out of sheer hate and sheer we don't like you living in our neighborhood and vice versa. So part of it is also just demographic changes that are happening across the county. Just as we're sitting down to do that interview with Alex, the call comes in. Killer, the emotional gang member, is angry. He's agitated and he's anxious to be heard. Killer has agreed to talk with someone who he professes to be his mortal enemy, a journalist of Mexican descent. As we meet, the tension between us is undeniable. It's been happening. They actually then took over some black neighborhoods and made it all Mexican now. So really what you're talking about is a shifting the way the area has changed. Yes, definitely. Just the, in general, it doesn't in even general, matter if, if you're If all the Mexicans wanted to come across the border, we wouldn't be having this problem right now. Well, you're sounding a lot like a minute man. Call it what you want. Killer sets two ground rules, that his face be hidden and his voice altered. And all blacks should be aware that Mexicans have a problem with blacks. And the more populated they get, the worse it's going to get. Is that a threat? Yes, it's a threat. How do we know Killer is legit? He was brought to us by T. Rogers, a former gang leader. Now he's an author and consultant to several police departments. After 20 minutes, here's what Killer had to say. And it's no offense to you, Ms. Diaz, because I know you got this panic in you, something like that. I don't have a problem with all Mexicans. But the one who's supposed to threaten black people. The irony here, Cheryl Green lived in a violent neighborhood, but she lived worlds away from Killer's world. I had many friends of different cultures, Samoan, Asian, 
Hispanics. She is my baby. Cheryl Green was only 14 when she was murdered. She recently wrote a poem that started, I am black and beautiful. I wonder how I will be living in the future. And there you go. Um, very sad. That was, that was a very sad clip, but I want, I, it was important to play that. It's just, it's, it's just showing that the hatred, you know, the hatred. Now, these are these clips are kind of old. You know, my, they, 2007, 2008, 2010, somewhere around there. Um, but um, when I looked up updated information on um, the relations between black and brown people, um, it hasn't gotten any worse, but it hasn't uh, hasn't gotten any better. You got some critics that say it's gotten better, but due to the fact of Black Lives Matter and all the shootings that was have been going on during the Obama administration, how all the black people. But it's not, you know, we, they've been showing a lot of black people. But there's a lot of brown people, a lot of a lot of brown people, Native American and, and Mexican people have been gunned down, unarmed Latino people, unarmed Mexican people, shot down by cops. You know, as well as Na- Native American uh, people as well on the re- on the reservation, Hi- you know. So, them those statistics and they didn't get a whole lot. Of, and, and media has not gotten a whole lot of media to uh, the Latino community and the Native American community that also was affected during that period by uh, killer cops that were killing uh, unarmed uh, minorities just in general. And so, but uh, so I wanted to play that, and I also had this article that was going to speak to the fact that. Uh, that for some reason, by the 1990s, that's when the relations started, the, the, the ethnic um, thing between the gangs been going on. Um, and what people need to know that when you talk about gangs, you're talking about families because these, these, um, these, these young men and these young women, well, gang members have families. You feel me? They have families that are affected. Um, by violence and by the things that's going on and so it's important for us to reach out to them and talk to them and talk about the issue and what we need to do and basically we black people we need to understand their situation brown people we need to understand our situation and we need to learn to understand one another and bring things together to a resolution so that's what i'm talking about we need to unify as a people and get you back the way it was and not let the colonialism divide the peoples anymore exactly exactly we need to get together as a people you know um i i, I was gonna i wanted to play it at, during this session to bring some um some positivity to the situation because listening to the two audio casts that i played which were talking about um the gang situation and how it was about basically about color not the color of rags but the color of people's skin um, I wanted to play something because you know you got people like uh, uh, Fat Joe, the rapper, and um, um, people like Fat Joe, uh, Ice Cube as well, that are trying to. Um, uh, oh, it's also Immortal Technique, the rapper Immortal Technique, that's trying to make a change in this area. Um, bring you know get black and brown people to realize we got to come together as a people. We got too many commonalities to be hurting one another. We got and actually and also when it comes to history, when it comes to indigenous history, when it comes to Native American history, and in that situ- and in that going down that historical road, we have more than just commonalities. We have genetic family ties, and uh, and in almost most of those cases, people don't know that, and some people don't care, but we should care because history does matter and being family to one another uh, should matter as well. So, Queen, do you have anything you want to say? No, it's... <laughs> I pretty much say what I need to say. Pretty much say what you need to say. You know, black and brown. Regardless of the bl- uh, black people killing black people, Mexican people killing Mexican people, black people killing Mexican people, Mexican killing black people, we are family kill killing each other and we got that stuff that ignorance gotta stop man we gotta come together as a people man love and eat and have fun you feel me as a people so um i will continue this in a part two uh the um you know i will continue this subject matter that we're talking about right now which is about black and brown which in a part two the divide and breakdown of the black and brown unity um, because I got some other audio casts I'm going to upload, but I've ran out of time. So I'm going to end my show and I will be back. And everybody, and, and I will be black next delicious black Sunday. Dropping nothing but the raw and uncut. 
And uh, so I hope what I have played and what I have talked about uh, has educated somebody on some level of realizing that black and brown people, we got to be a family. We got to come together as one people, you know, in one love. You feel me? With one love and one respect for one another on one level. You feel me? And we will do that. We just got to persevere and push it and bring it together and come down and sit to get sit down to get sit down like a family at the table and communicate and talk. So I will continue this next week. The divided and break the the divide and breakdown with the black and brown unity. So this is JC AKI for Black. You can always join us here every Sunday from three to four Pacific Standard Time, West Coast. You feel me? It doesn't cost you a dime, just a bit of your conscious time. So join us next Sunday. I will see you. I gotta go. I'm out. Bye. Don't get it wrong, it's more than a song It's black and brown pride one time Do something for you die, this is black and brown pride Bang it on the system one time Now don't get me wrong, it's more than a song It's black and brown pride one time Yo, I'm sorry cause I'm new You know sorry's not enough And you're sorry when your deputies are stopping Marty This motherfucker bought a tank To blow up my posse Wild West funny You call yourself a posse Deputy Here's my middle finger Officer my popular voters to departure And cop in your career and get my poppin' I bring them shock and awe Warning signs Saw my spleen broke his spine See his team he paid to run He had to pay to play the crime A little baby laid it like a tattoo From envelope Separation anxiety I'm holding on the positive Tear gas in a box See and on the ground, I'm stopping fully. Throw on 36s, I'm rolling shotgun and popping oozes. I'm popping, it's a party go. This mother loving bully. You're what I envision as a mully. America's nightmare. Euthanasia and green light. Here it is. Do something for you die. This is black and brown pride. Bang it on the system one time. Now don't get me wrong. It's more than a song. It's black and brown pride one time. Do something for you die. This is black and brown pride. Bang it on the system one time.